Donald Farber, a docent at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. And today I'm gonna to be telling you about how it is that we got to the moon. To set some perspective, NASA as an organization was not at all interested in going to the moon initially. NASA was established in 1959. And there were some dreamers who thought about doing this, but NASA had an intent of just getting man into space, not necessarily going to the moon. But at that time, there was a Cold War going on between the USSR, the Soviet Union, and the United States. And the Soviet Union was beating us badly in space. They were the first to orbit a satellite in October of 1957 called Sputnik. They were first to orbit an animal, a dog named Laika. And then as both the USSR and the US were getting ready to launch man into space, the Soviet Union beat us to it by several months. Yuri Gagarin was the first in space and also the first to orbit the earth. So the USSR was winning, if you will, the Cold War in space. The second thing is that the Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba had failed badly. And this sort of put a stain on the United States and President Kennedy as well. So President Kennedy needed something big at that time and needed to really get the country motivated. And one way he thought to do it was to be in space. And so he went to Congress, asked for money and said, quite clearly, we should aim to land a man on the moon and return him safely to earth before the 1960s were at an end. NASA took this as an imperative and began thinking about how could we do this? Well, the first thing they needed to do was to pick astronauts. They had already picked the, those astronauts, though they needed more. And one of the things is, uh, what were the qualifications? They had to be a college graduate. Most of the in initial astronauts were from either West Point or Annapolis, Annapolis. Later astronauts were from some other colleges as well. They had to be in perfect health and they had to have a lot of experience as a pilot, both as a fighter pilot usually, as well as in a, as a test pilot. NASA then invited some of these people who had applied for exams, both psychological as well as physical examinations and interviews, and then selected a select group of astronauts from that pool. This is just uh, one example of what some of the astronauts were doing. This is a photograph of the X-15 space plane that the US Air Force was experimenting with. It was rocket powered and those uh, Air Force people or, and or test pilots climbed aboard, rocketed up to as high as 50 miles above the earth and as fast as six or seven Mach, meaning six or seven times the speed of sound. These were the first seven astronauts, and we'll talk about them in a minute. As I mentioned, Alan Shepard, who is here, was the first US astronaut actually into space. And that was before President Kennedy set us on our goal to go to the moon. The first seven astronauts who were known also as the Mercury astronauts, because they flew the Mercury missions, were Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, John Glenn, Scott Carpenter, Wally Schirra, and Gordon Cooper. There was a seventh astronaut, Deke Slayton, who unfortunately could not fly at this time because he had a, a heart problem that prevented him from flying. He actually was cleared much later and did get to fly, but after uh, we had gone to the moon. So what training did these astronauts have once they joined NASA? Well, there was general training and this included classroom work. And that was one or more years of this classroom work, including things like rocket systems, orbital mechanics, space medicine, 
a whole host of things that they had to learn about uh, spacecraft and space flight rather than their usual aircraft that they had been trained in. They had survival training, both in deserts and jungles, in case the spacecraft did not land where it was supposed to, which was in one of two oceans, either the Pacific or Atlantic Ocean. They had physical training and flight training. Uh, so they continued to fly their jets and NASA had provided them with uh, their own jets to be able to uh, continue their training. And they also train in spacecraft simulators. And then the, they had specific mission training um, for each mission. And there was always somebody who was the prime crew, meaning they were the ones who were gonna have a particular mission and they had a backup crew in case something happened to the prime crew who would also train on that mission. Uh, one of the ways they also trained uh, the physical training was a centrifuge. The spacecraft they knew would reach very high G levels. That is uh, numbers of times the weight uh, somebody would be on, on earth. So that, for example, if somebody was encountering five Gs, a 200 pound man would be experiencing actually a thousand pounds of force on his body. So they had to get used to that. And this G, this centrifuge, allowed them to reach high G levels so that they could experience what that was like and figure out ways of countering it. So how we actually got to the moon was in stages. NASA always was interested in doing one step at a time so that once they had accomplished one part of the mission, they could go on to the next part until they eventually got to the moon. So there were three different stages, if you will. The Mercury missions included a single astronaut in a capsule, and they had a maximum of one and a half days in orbit. Gemini had two astronauts aboard and they tested different aspects of spaceflight, which would have been necessary to be able to encounter a moon mission. And then Apollo had three astronauts. There were missions leading up to the moon landing and then moon landings themselves. So the Mercury missions were our first exploration of space. It was, as I said, a one-man crew. There were a total of six missions. There were two suborbital missions with Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom aboard, and then four orbital missions. John Glenn with three orbits, Scott Carpenter also with three orbits, Wally Wishara with six orbits, and then Gordon Cooper with 22 orbits, lasting basically 33 and a half hours. And the real missions of Mercury were just to test whether space was safe for humans to live and work in. So basically the astronaut did some minor things with adjusting the attitude of the spacecraft, but not its orbit. Um, they were able to test out whether they could eat and drink in space and just basically uh, observe what was going on around them. This is an Atlas missile that we have at the Gillespie Annex of the, Nash, of the uh, San Diego Air and Space Museum. And this missile was the missile that launched, or the rocket, I should say, that launched the orbital missions of Mercury um, after the first two suborbital missions. And this is, Wally Shara posing next to that combination, the Atlas missile below, and then the Mercury capsule located here with its escape tower. And this is another picture of the, the Mercury capsule and its escape, escape tower. Each of the missions had um, some kind of means of escaping in, in case the rocket had a problem on liftoff. This is a model that we have in the museum that shows the in interior of 
the mercury capsule. And as you could see, it was fairly cramped. Although the rock, the uh, astronauts were, upon riding on the rocket, were strapped in. Once they reached orbit, they would be floating and therefore it would be much more comfortable. This is some of the, one of the suits that would be used by the Mercury astronauts. Uh, it was to protect them in case the capsule depressurized. It was never meant to be outside the spacecraft. And so it was basically a rubber bladder that protected them just in case they lost the pressure in the capsule. So these were the Mercury Redstone flights. The, Merc the Redstone rocket had a total thrust of only 75,000 pounds of thrust. So it was not a very large or potent rocket. It was meant to just get the astronaut above uh, into space. And they went generally about 118 miles above the Earth's surface. And then they would come right back down. So it was a suborbital flight lasting only about 15 minutes with only about five to 10 minutes of weightless flight. The Mercury Atlas flights were longer duration, as I said. These were actually orbital flights, um, lasting anywhere from three to 22 orbits. And each of the missions would splash down in the ocean and be recovered by one of the aircraft carriers that were assigned to meet them. After the Mercury missions were completed, NASA then had to go on to the Gemini missions. These were much more complicated and much more involved. Each mission had a two-man crew aboard rather than a one-man crew. And there were a total of 10 missions. And these were designed to test and have us learn five major points to allow us to get to the moon. First was the ability to safely use hypergolic engines in space. A hypergolic engine is one that uses a very highly active rocket fuel called hydrazine and a very active oxidizer called nitrogen tetroxide. So that when the two mix, they mix completely and self-ignite. So it's a very simple, lightweight engine which allows us to have engines on board the spacecraft rather than just launching us into space. Uh, and we tested these out uh, in, in the Gemini missions. The second thing we needed to do is be, have the ability to function in space up to two weeks. As I said, the longest mission in Mercury was 33 and a half hours, but going to the moon itself takes two and a half days. Uh, there's two and a half days coming back from the moon, as well as time getting ready to explore the moon and then actually exploring the moon. And this can take anywhere from eight to, to 12 or 14 days uh, to be able to accomplish. So we had to know that we could function safely in space up to two weeks. We also needed to know that we could function safely outside the spacecraft. We had never been in space itself outside of the spacecraft. Um, but we needed to do so, first of all, in case there was a problem and we needed to do some either outside repairs or go from one spacecraft to another. And also so that we knew that we would be safe walking on the moon. Uh, a fourth thing was the ability to dock two spacecraft together, to attach them together. Um, this was a part and parcel of the way we were gonna to get to the moon, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And so we needed to know we could do that. But more complicated than that was the ability to rendezvous with another spacecraft in orbit. And this is very complicated because you, the spacecraft does not do what you think it does or should do anyway, from what we experience on earth. For example, when two spacecraft are in orbit and one wants to get up to the other spacecraft, you would think they would just fire their thruster and match up with the other spacecraft. When in, fa in fact, what happens is they add energy so they go to a higher orbit. 
either on around Earth or around the moon. And when they do that, they slow down because as you get further away from the planet, you go slower in orbit. So instead of getting closer to the other spacecraft, you actually move farther apart. And we needed to figure out ways in which we could do it uh, in a different manner. This is a model of the Gemini spacecraft. The astronauts sat in here in the major portion of the spacecraft. And this was an adapter that contained a means of propulsion, being able to change orbit for the first time, as well as fuel cells that would last for more than two weeks, allowing us energy and, and creating water that we needed. So that uh, this adapter was the key to our experimenting successfully in, in space to allow us to do these kind, figure out these kinds of things we needed to be able to accomplish our moon missions. This is the liftoff of the Titan rocket with the Gemini capsule and adapter on top of it. And all of the other rockets that we used, used a, a cooled type of fuel, um, usually a, a, what we call a cryogenic fuel, either liquid oxygen or liquid hydrogen cooled to several hundred degrees below zero um, so that it becomes a liquid. And that requires a very complex type of engine. The Gemini for the first, the Titan rocket actually for the first time had that hypergolic engine I was just talking about. And that's what was propelling it into space. So this was our first experimentation with manned use of those engines. Another aspect, as I mentioned, was the ability to walk safely and walk, quote unquote, safely in space. And this is Ed White doing the first spacewalk or extravehicular activity aboard Gemini 4. And he was the, the first American to do this. The Russians still had us beat in space. They had a, a cosmonaut named Leonov who, who did the first walk in space. But thereafter, the United States took the lead in getting us to the moon. This is the first time that we rendezvoused in space. Gemini 6 was supposed to lift off, rendezvous, and dock with a booster rocket that had a collar on it so that it could dock with it. But the rocket that was carrying that other spacecraft exploded. And so what NASA did is they launched Gemini 7, which was a long duration method mission, and then went ahead and launched Gemini 6A to be able to go up uh, rendezvous with the uh, Gemini 7 that was already in space. They weren't able to dock because they didn't have the collar, but they were able to rendezvous and keep station with the other spacecraft only a foot apart. So clearly we were, this was a, a clear success in that we learned how to rendezvous. And we knew basically that at this point, all you do is fire your thrusters very gently and you would dock if there was that collar available. So we knew we, we had learned how to do this. All of these missions allowed us to go on to Apollo, which was the main missions that led us to and had us walking on the moon. The early Apollo missions were still testing. Apollo 7 tested out the command and service modules for the first time. Uh, that, and these were the Apollo uh, command and service modules. Apollo 8, uh, for the first time, man orbited the moon. And for the first time, we laid our own eyes on the dark side of the moon. That had never been done before. Apollo 9 tested out the lunar module in Earth orbit. And then Apollo 10 tested out the lunar module in lunar orbit and did not land on the moon, but was close to it. And so uh, Apollo 10, NASA labeled its dress rehearsal. This is a model of the Apollo command module. 
and then its service module. Uh, the service mod, the uh, astronauts, the three astronauts, and, and Apollo each had uh, each mission of Apollo had three astronauts in it. Uh, would sit in the command module or float in the command module, and the service module had means of propulsion, had a large engine to be able to get into and out of uh, lunar orbit. Um, it also had these thrusters for maintaining different attitudes of, of the entire complex and had fuel cells aboard that provided energy and water to the astronauts. Its accompaniment was the lunar module, which it would have docked with uh, on the way to the moon. And this was the uh, spacecraft that actually separated from the command module, went down and landed on the moon. And then its uh, upper stage, the ascent stage, would go up, back up to, again, rendezvous and dock with the command module to transfer the astronauts back on board in order to be able to get back to Earth. The rocket engine that we have in the museum is a, a real ascent stage engine uh, from the lunar module. Again, it's hypergolic, meaning that it's able to be lightweight, uh, very reliable, and we needed that to be able to get men off the moon surface. This would be the configuration of the uh, spacecrafts uh, on the way to the moon. The command module dock with the two stages of the lunar module and then its service module, uh, which was attached to the command module that provided power, thrust, uh, and uh, electricity, water, et cetera. This is a Saturn V rocket. Uh, that powered us to the moon. This was, up until that time, the most powerful rocket ever developed and still is the, the, the tallest rocket ever developed that carried man. It contained three stages. The command and uh, service modules that you saw earlier were just this part of the rocket. The lunar module would be situated in here in a little garage, basically. And we'll talk about how that worked, but the first, second, and third stages would fire to get us into orbit, the, with the first and second stages falling away to Earth sequentially. The third stage would shut down. We would do an orbit and a half in around the Earth. Then the third stage would fire again to get us to escape velocity to put us on the way to the moon. At that point, the command and service module would separate from the rest of the rocket, turn around, and the, the lunar module sitting here it, uh, with its the top of it facing upward, the command module would dock with it, pull it out of the garage, and they'd be on the way to the moon. Just to give you an idea of how big the, the rocket was. This is just the first stage of the Saturn V. And you can see some men standing at the bottom of it uh, here. It's on its side. These are the five engines. And you can see that each engine is about twice the size of a man uh, across. Each of these engines generated one and a half million pounds of thrust for a total of seven and a half million pounds of thrust. Um, it was quite huge. When it went off, it, it people felt the vibration more than heard it. And the sound was uh, audible for, it said for about a hundred miles from the point of its liftoff. Astronauts you saw earlier had just that rubber bladder uh, to protect them in the spacecraft. Apollo was fully dedicated to being able to be in space, including outside the spacecraft if needed. And therefore each of the Apollo astronauts were a space group that was 
protected from uh, space from the env the environment of a vacuum in space. It was also protected from the heat and cold, as in space as well as on the moon, temperatures can go from minus three hundred and fifty degrees all the way to positive three hundred and fifty degrees, depending on whether you're in shade or sun. And uh, so each of the astronauts were also protected from micrometeorites that might uh, occasionally hit the suit. So it was a very complex suit and, and meant to fully protect the astronauts. So going on to the missions, Apollo 7 was the Earth first Earth orbit mission. And it basically just tested out the functioning of the command and service modules, including its uh, orbital changes, the, the function of the uh, service modules uh, propulsion system, that, that big engine that would get us into and out of lunar orbit. And this was a, a, a mission that lasted several days and tested all those functions out. It was launched with the Saturn 1B, which was a uh, less powerful rocket than the Saturn V. And that was uh, not necessary to have the larger rocket because all it had was the command and service modules. It did not have a lunar module aboard and it was not meant to go actually to the moon. Apollo 8 was originally scheduled to test out the lunar module in Earth orbit. The problem was that Grohman hadn't quite gotten ready with the lunar module yet. And so NASA decided that they would basically swap missions. So Apollo 8 became the mission where we first orbited the moon. Apollo 9 became the mission where we tested out the lunar module. So this was the first time man had actually orbited the moon and actually laid sight uh, with his own eyes on the dark side of the moon. And it was the first manned flight of the Saturn V rocket. This was the Apollo Saturn V liftoff. The Saturn V was uh, 300, including the uh, Apollo spacecraft, was 363 feet tall. Uh, for any football fans out there, that's the equivalent of an entire football field, including both end zones, turned on its side. Um, that's how tall this thing was. And it had seven and a half million pounds of thrust. Um, this is the iconic photo from uh, Apollo 8 that basically captured all of our imagination. This is taken from Apollo 8 as they're orbiting the moon and it shows Earth rise. The Earth, this small blue marble um, rising above the lunar surface. And it, it, people understood that there were these three men aboard a spacecraft, but absolutely everybody else was here. Uh, and it, it gave the astronauts a tremendous perspective, not only on what they were doing, but on where we all had come from. Apollo 9, was the mission that tested out the lunar module in Earth orbit. There were two astronauts that climbed into the lunar module. They separated from the command module by 100 miles using the descent stage engine. At that point, they were 100 miles away and the lunar module was a very thin uh, covered uh, device that would not have survived re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. And so it was the first time that two astronauts were in a spacecraft that could not get back to Earth. They had to get back to the command module where they would not have survived. Um, luckily, they were quite easily able to rendezvous and dock with the command module using the ascent engine. And this proved that basically the concept of using the lunar module was, was one um, that was safe and uh, doable, basically. We also experimented with the first two-man spacewalk. This was necessary to show that two men could be out in space together or walking on the moon together. And then one other thing is the lunar exploration suit that had a, a self-contained backpack uh, 
was tested out for the first time. And this is the two-man space, spacewalk. This is Jim McDivitt outside the lunar module, who's taking a picture of Dave Scott, who's here outside the command module. And this is a picture of the lunar module taken from the command module just after they separated uh, and before the, the lunar module fired its uh, descent engine and moved 100 miles away from the command module. And you can see that it's Earth because of the, the clouds and, and ocean below it. This is a picture of the actual Apollo 9 command module after it splashed down. It's now sitting in the, in the San Diego Air and Space Museum. We have it in our uh, space gallery and uh, it is there for anybody to take, a, to take a look at. And this is a, a picture inside. You see the three chairs that the astronauts would be strapped into lying down on their backs for liftoff and re-entry. Uh, and it would be uh, the commander of the mission on the left, the lunar module pilot on the right, and the command module pilot in the center. Apollo 10 then uh, went on to a lunar orbital mission. And this uh, went down, the, the lunar module went down to 40,000 feet above the lunar surface. And the, these pictures are taken, this one from the lunar module, taking it of the command module, and this one of the command module, taking it of the lunar module. And you can see the, the lunar background in, in, uh, behind the, each of them. So this is after they had separated and the lunar module was actually on the way back to the command module. We were now ready and Apollo 11, the first moon landing launched on July 16th of 1969 with a Saturn V. On July 19th, it achieved lunar orbit. And on July 20th, uh, this is a picture from, from orbit. On July 10th, 20th was the actual first lunar landing by man. And this is the Eagle down on Tr Tranquility Base in the Sea of Tranquility on the moon. It shows the, the lunar module having landed uh, with some of the, uh, with a, the American flag planted, a solar wind experiment having been placed there. And these are the kinds of photos that the astronauts saw from the lunar surface. This is a uh, montage that we have in the, in the museum. The suit is real. Uh, this is Neil Armstrong's practice suit that we have, but it's identical to the one he wore on the moon. And as you see, it's the complex suit that all the astronauts on Apollo wore, except now they have a backpack. Uh, so it's self-contained. And uh, the visor is coated with gold to protect them from UV radiation. But this is picture, picturing Neil Armstrong as he would have been at the bottom of the ladder on the moon. And this is actually the, a photograph of the, of the uh, footstep, if you will, on the moon surface. Lunar dust, which was originally thought to be a, a problem, ended up not to be a problem as it was only about an inch to two inches thick. And this is another iconic photograph uh, taken by Neil Armstrong of Buzz Aldrin, but uh, Neil Armstrong is reflected in Buzz Aldrin's visor. So it's also a selfie at the same time near the lunar module. So we reached the moon, what now? Well, um, first of all, we need, needed to explore it in lots of different ways. This is a rock box that we have in a museum that contained about 47 pounds of rocks brought back by Apollo 11 
Uh, it was a uh, sealed container so that it would be in lunar atmosphere, which is extremely thin uh, compared to Earth with no oxygen present so that the rocks could be explored back on Earth uh, without oxygen affecting them. So collection of rocks was important. And this is one of the rocks we have in the museum. The astronauts also put out experiments. Each of the, the landings put out experiments on the moon surface, seismometers to see if there were uh, moon quakes, uh, magnemometers to detect the, if there's a magnetic uh, pole on the, on the moon surface, various other instruments as well. Um, and each, each uh, landing had some of these instruments that were put out. And then of course, photography as well. After exploring the moon, it would be time to go home. Uh, the astronauts would climb back on board the lunar module, the lunar, the ascent engine would fire and the ascent stage would come back up and meet the command module as it's doing here. And then eventually uh, they would fire their uh, propulsion system engine uh, head back to Earth, uh, separate from all the pieces, and the command module would re-enter and splash down in uh, usually in the Pacific Ocean. And this is a picture of the astronauts in their uh, biohazard suits climbing back on board. Well, each of the astron each of the Apollo missions had a certain number of hours on board on the moon surface certain number of EVAs they did and a certain amount of uh, pounds of rocks. But there were actually six lunar landings, not just one. Each of them had, as I said, experiment package, a sample collection of photography. And the last three missions, 15, 16, and 17, had a lunar rover so that they could explore both near and far away, up to 10 miles from the lunar module. What's next? Next is Artemis. And this is a NASA image showing the space launch system, which is this. It's shorter than the Saturn V, but actually has much, much larger thrust, 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust. This is the Orion capsule and service module, which will seat four astronauts instead of three. And the schedule is to have an uncrewed launch in lunar orbit. Um, as you view this, you, we may have already done this. Uh, it's scheduled to be uh, within the next week or two, hopefully, as I record this at the beginning of September. In 2023, there'll be a crewed launch and lunar orbit. And sometime before 2025 or during 2025, will be the next moon landing at the South Pole. And this is uh, a picture of it. It would be in dark because they'd be at the bottom of a crater uh, at the pole. Uh, and why there? Because there is about 6 trillion tons of water ice at the South and North Pole in the moon surface. And this will allow us to set up hopefully a habitat on the moon as well as a space station around the moon and go on from there to other places deeper in space. And with that, I'll end. And uh, thank you for listening to this presentation.